podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Matt Halley. I'm a member of the uh, engineering and marketing team here at Buckley Associates. Uh, before we start the webinar, I'm just going to say a few words. First of all, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate you taking your time out of your day to uh, spend with us learning. Uh, we've been doing this for uh, some time now since March. So if you'd like to see some of our previous webinars, you can find them on our YouTube page at Buckley Associates. Um, a lot of a lot of effort goes into planning these webinars, um, and we're happy that you see value in uh, spending your time with us today. So today we're going to be talking about uh, multifamily unit ventilation systems uh, and actually the energy code related to those systems. So this might be familiar to some of you that have been following us since March. Uh, there's actually been some changes since then in the Massachusetts energy code. So to start it off, we're gonna we're gonna talk quite a bit about those changes, and then we're gonna uh, dive deeper into the type of uh, equipment that you can be using for those designs. And then at the end of the t at the end of the webinar, I'll be giving a, a sh really short presentation about fire rated air distributions, um, considering that it has quite a bit to do with these types of designs. So these are topics that the whole Buckley team is very familiar with. We actually have ten engineers on board that are ready and willing to help you on any design applications you have. So after this presentation, feel free to reach out to myself or Sherry Malone, who sent you this invite, and we can point you in the right direction or help you ourselves um, if you're unaware of who your Buckley uh, point of contact is. So we have quite a few people signed up today. Um, if you have a question during the, during the uh, presentation, just feel free to send it to the questions bar. I believe you should see that in front of you in the, on the, the dock there. Uh, and I'll either stop Scott to answer the question, answer it myself, or if there's a lot of questions, we may send it afterwards. Um, so we're gonna get going. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Scott McMurray. He's the North American Business Lines Manager. And uh, go ahead, Scott. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and and welcome to the training session. Uh, today, we're going to be covering compartmentalized ventil ventilation system design for multifamily, um, specifically focusing on some of the uh, unique things uh, that are involved with Massachusetts Energy Code. Uh, so this presentation has been put together uh, with the assistance with uh, some local engineers in your market, um, which we greatly appreciated because of course uh, as is always the case with code uh, a lot of things are open to interpretation and uh, sometimes it's difficult for for me as a manufacturer to try to be aware of everything that's going on within an individual market so um, we put this presentation together uh, matt and i did uh, in an effort to really try to answer as many questions as we possibly could on on these topics So the agenda for today, uh, as I discussed, we're gonna focus specifically on, on some codes, uh, recent code changes uh, within Massachusetts. Uh, I gave a presentation on a similar topic back in August and, and coincidentally in August, there were some code changes. So that presentation uh, was not updated for those code changes. And so uh, some of the material that we'll be covering today will be new uh, based on those changes. Uh, so we'll, we'll review some of the, the highlights with those changes, some things that you should be aware of. Uh, then we're gonna jump into some typical system design. Specifically, again, we're focusing on uh, ventilation systems. So typical ventilation system design in multifamily. And then we're gonna start talking about unitized ventilation systems. Um, what that means, uh, what it does for, for cost, how it impacts indoor air quality, you know, kind of the, the hot button topics of the day. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the equipment that we'll use in those types of systems. So of course, Massachusetts Energy Code, right? This picture is, uh, is I think, is about as accurate as, as it can get. You know, code is, is certainly not the easiest thing to try to interpret and it jumps all over the place, especially in, in regards to uh, Massachusetts Energy Code when we're looking at something like 780 CMR where it goes back and forth between 90.1, the IBC, the IMC, and the IECC, uh, plus the amendments in 780 and the also stretch code. So there's a lot of information here and, and certainly it can be a a difficult thing to to digest but we're gonna do our best today and, and hopefully this will be 
uh, informative for everyone. So to start, you know, the the foundation that we start with in, in most cases is going to be the uh, International Building Code. Of course, we are talking multifamily, so multifamily could be residential, it could be three stories or less, and so it would primarily focus on the International Building Code. Um, some of the things that we talk about when we look at things like ventilation are infiltration rates, right? Especially on the three stories or less category, the, the low rise multifamily or even single family home. Um, when we look at the uh, codes and the variances between the International Building Code, the International Mechanical Code, uh, or the IECC, uh, one of the big differences that we see in the IBC is the allowance for an infiltration rate. So when we have the infiltration rate, um, basically it allows us to have a, a ventilation credit, right? So we don't have to mechanically ventilate as long as we can prove that we have natural ventilation through the infiltration rate. And, and what that would be would be a, uh, an air change of uh, five air changes per hour or more, and then you wouldn't have to mechanically ventilate, right? But the reality is when we look at, uh, at, at code and we figure out what kind of, of ventilation rates that would be, just to give an example, if we were to do a blower door test on a single family home, or even a, a small apartment, let's say a thousand square foot with nine foot ceilings, we would have to measure 750 CFM of infiltration in order to satisfy the minimum air changes per hour uh, to avoid requiring mechanical ventilation. The reality is that's way too high. Um, that's not something that that uh, is going to be easy to work with from an energy model standpoint. Um, and not only that, when we look at things like the IECC, when we look at our, our thermal barriers and we look at what kind of leakage is allowed, um, you can't exceed three air changes per hour per the IECC uh, in your thermal barrier. So it can get kind of difficult and that's definitely one of the um, codes that, that can be open to interpretation. But just about everyone that we've talked to agrees that sure, the International Building Code says you can do five air changes per hour, but elsewhere in the code says you can't. So that pretty much immediately forces us into the International Mechanical Code. So when we look at the International Mechanical Code in, in the simplest form, basically it says you need to ventilate mechanically, right, i.e. a fan, and you need to do so in a way that you can provide approximately the same amount of fresh air and exhaust air, right? And that's because when we're looking at uh, commercial spaces, right, because that's predominantly where the, the International Mechanical Code is going to live. When we're looking at these commercial spaces or high-rise buildings, um, it gets very, very important to deal with pressurization, right? Pressurization in multifamily is far more important than single family. And a lot of that is due to cross-contamination, uh, movement of, of, you know, any kind of unwanted uh, air movement between spaces, right? And that's going to be driven purely by pressure. And the larger the system, the more difficult it is to control that pressure. Then moving into from, from the International Mechanical Code to the uh, IECC, uh, specifically, this is one of the changes that we've got uh, going from the 2015 IECC to the 2018 IECC. And I've uh, highlighted the last row of this table. So this table is the energy recovery requirement. And of course it says, for ventilation systems operating not less than 8,000 hours per year. So basically what it's saying is ventilation systems that operate all year. Um, so when we're looking at these systems, the change between 2015 and 2018 in, in this last row here, um, which applies to um, climate zone 5A, which is the, the Massachusetts area, previously those values were all zeros. They were not, you know, 200, 130, et cetera. So what that does is that allows, uh, it gives a little bit of flexibility to those very small systems, um, you know, PTAC style systems, the really small units where uh, it's just not realistic to have energy recovery integrated into that type of equipment. So this change was, was really done to, um, take that into consideration and make it a little easier to work with. But the reality is when we're looking at something like multifamily, um, and, and most of those those 
air handling unit style of designs are going to be exceeding this threshold. So it's certainly going to, to suggest from this table that uh, energy recovery is required as part of our baseline energy modeling. Uh, another change for the 2018 IECC uh, that has been adopted is this section here. And now it doesn't apply specifically to multifamily, but it's R1 buildings, so hotels, motels. Um, those properties now uh, are going to require the uh, use of in-suite controls for shutting down the outside air and the exhaust air to each room. So basically what that means is when the space is unoccupied, there has to be some kind of device that's going to close and, and uh, shut off the outside air or the exhaust air into that space. Now that can be done, of course, by a lot of different means. Um, if we're using fans, the fans can be shut off. Uh, we can use um, motorized dampers to, to close off that room from a central system. Uh, so there's certainly a lot of methods to do that. Uh, one option that we certainly recommend is use of the zone register terminal, uh, which is a device that, that we manufacture in, in Buckley Associates cells for your area. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about the product today just because it doesn't really apply to the conversation for multifamily, but it is a code change and I want to uh, make sure that I keep everybody as informed as I can. So if anybody has any questions on those projects uh, or types of projects or zone register terminals, uh, feel free to reach out to, to Matt or, or Sherry at any time and we'll get you more information on those. So jumping into the 780 CMR, uh, which is is you know the amendments specific to Massachusetts, which are basically uh, changes to the International Building Code. So of course the first thing it says with the 780 CMR, which is amendments to the IBC 2015, is uh, now we're going to start using uh, the 2018 IECC, right? So. Again, all those changes that we were just reviewing uh, that are changes to the 2018 IECC are now in effect. Um, and of course, in many places in Massachusetts, we also have to consider that we're going to be using the stretch code, right? So with the stretch code, for anybody who's not familiar, um, that calls for uh, basically surpassing the uh, energy requirements by 10%. Right, so that's a pretty significant uh, increase considering 780 by itself is already an increase in, in the requirement beyond the 2018 IECC in many categories. So it's certainly uh, not an easy thing to address. But talking about some of the significant changes for the 780 CMR uh, that were, were put into effect uh, last year, uh, one of them in particular is the change for uh, fenestration percentage allowance, right? So now it is 24%. Uh, previously, or per the 2018 IECC, it's 30% as our baseline. Uh, now it's 24%. So that certainly is going to have a, a pretty big impact on how we energy model. Uh, and it's going to uh, you know, force us to re require things uh, potentially like triple pane windows if, if we wanna have a very large percentage of, of glass on an exterior wall, uh, which can definitely add a, a, a significant chunk of cost to the building. Another significant change between 780 CMR and the IECC are things like the lighting power density, right? In multifamily, it was 0.68 per the IECC, now it's 0.45. So that's a pretty significant change from a, a percentage standpoint. And you can see, of course, 780 CMR doesn't apply exclusively to multifamily. There's a lot of stuff on here. Uh, sometimes it actually makes it a little easier. Uh, for example, automotive facilities, 0.71 versus 0.75. Uh, but when we look at like a movie theater, 0.83 to 0.44. So nearly a 50% reduction in, in the lighting power density. So some of these things get very large. Uh, museums, for example, 1.06 versus 0.55. So certainly 780 CMR is, is really focusing on from, from a majority uh, of, of applications at being more strict. 
another uh, pretty significant change um, or difference between 780 CMR versus the IECC uh, comes from section 406.1. In the CMR, it says that we must comply with at least three of the following 10 items, right? So some of these things are more efficient HVAC systems, uh, the reduced lighting power density, some of the items that we were just talking about, uh, on-site supply of renewable energy. So we're definitely going to see things like solar panels and things like that. Um, and then you're going to have other items um, like enhanced envelope performance. You know, these are some of the items that we'll, we'll touch base on briefly in the, in the presentation. Um, you know, compare that to the IECC, it says one of the following, and there's only eight options, not 10. So at least with CMR, he gave us a couple more options uh, since there, we have to use three of them, um, but there's still a pretty significant, uh, that's a pretty significant challenge that we have to address. Plus, of course, things like stretch code. So ultimately, when we're looking at, at these amendments, uh, and we're focusing on on Massachusetts Energy Code specifically, I think we can all kind of agree that, you know, in regards to ventilation, because again, that's that's kind of the key topic of the day for the presentation, when we're looking at ventilation, it's increasingly more difficult to satisfy the energy model requirements without doing something like an, uh, an ERV, right, per, per that uh, section 4037.4. Uh, talking about uh, energy recovery requirements depending on the size of the system, uh, especially in stretch code towns, right, where where we have to exceed 780 CMR uh, by 10%. So what we're going to be talking about today is the fact that, you know, there are simple solutions that we can address to satisfy the energy code requirements while providing cost-effective and efficient solutions, right, in, in terms of the design uh, and the equipment that we use, which ultimately that's the intent of stretch code, is to not reinvent the wheel, but to uh, integrate cost-effective solutions that allow us to uh, exceed the base uh, requirements from, from an energy code standpoint. So when we look at uh, typical system design, right, we, we talk about old systems and new systems when, when we're looking at this, right? Some of this is going to be um, what we do today. Some of it's going to be what we did, you know, years ago. But it gives you kind of a baseline understanding of what the differences are uh, and what we typically see in central systems, right? So specifically, we're talking about central systems since by a large majority, central systems is, is the most common practice for uh, ventilation system design, especially in high-rise buildings and, and multifamily. So there's really three methods by which we see uh, central systems in use uh, in multifamily. One is passive makeup air, right? So I don't think passive makeup air is going to be something that's tremendously common in Massachusetts. There's certainly some projects out there that are going to utilize this uh, but i can't imagine that the the quantity is going to be very high um, basically the method by which this type of system works is you have uh, an exhaust fan somewhere right could be on the roof could be just local to the space generating negative pressure and we utilize that negative pressure to pull outside air in uh, through some device through passive openings, right? So for example, um, you know, we call those trickle vents or airlets, but basically they're just openings with very uh, low levels of filtration. Um, you know, you can see through them, they're really only designed to catch bugs and things like that. So certainly not a MERV-8, um, but the idea is it provides a, a pathway for the air to come in from the exterior wall. But ultimately, when we're relying on negative pressure to move air, there's no way to say that I'm getting 100% of my makeup air from the exterior, right? I'm, I'm still putting the entire space under negative pressure. And anytime that I'm going to have negative pressure, I'm going to have some kind of air movement from uh, you know um, interstitial spaces within the building. Uh, which are ultimately going to, re to, to result in um, contaminant movement from one room to the next or one floor to the next. 
especially when we're in tall buildings and we have things like stack effect and, and the pressure is considerably more difficult to try to control. It's one thing if every room is under the exact same negative pressure, then I can kind of reliably uh, say that the outside air is going to be some value, but we're not gonna see that in, in tall buildings. We're gonna have variable pressure from the first floor to the top floor, so it, it simply doesn't work. Another method, and this is definitely more common, uh, but it's not something that you're gonna see in new construction, is pressurized corridors. So basically what we're doing is we're utilizing the corridors as plenum space rather than running duct over to the uh, to the individual suites, right? So this was very popular because it had a low cost. Again, I'm not worrying too much about uh, a whole lot of duct. I don't have to worry about, um, you know, penetrating my fire rated barriers within the units. Um, so it was a very popular uh, type of design and, and really it was uh, a way to do something very similar to the passive design, uh, but it allowed us to rely um, on makeup air units, units to provide room neutral rather than drawing in raw, untreated and unfiltered outside air. However, it's virtually impossible to know exactly how much fresh air you're getting from the corridor. Um, part of that is, you know, sure, I can measure how much air is coming underneath the door, but how fresh is it really, right? How much of that is actually outside air? And that's one of the reasons that we don't do this anymore. It's not code compliant. You know, it's very difficult to control. And again, at the end of the day, you really don't know how much uh, outside air is entering each individual apartment. That brings us to today's primary solution when we're looking at high rise buildings. Um, that's a central ducted ventilation system. So instead of utilizing the corridors as um, my air distribution method or pathway, I'm ducting directly into each apartment. So I'm going to end up with a much greater level of control in this type of system. Sorry, I've got something that popped up on my screen. Get rid of it. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to end up uh, with a much higher level of control on this system. Um, but the the downside is uh, the system complexity uh, due to the size of the system, right? The bigger the system, the more variables we start to introduce, which makes it more difficult to control. Um, from a balancing standpoint, it's a complete nightmare, right? You're going to have many, many, many terminals that you have to balance off of a single fan. And as you try to balance these terminals, you know, you change the set point of one terminal and it's going to have some kind of impact on every other terminal device within that system. So it creates a situation where they're very difficult to balance and control. And then you also have to factor in things like stack effect, right? Stack effect is, is going to be a big driving factor to uh, changing pressures within the system, which make these systems uh, virtually impossible to control accurately as they get larger. So when we look at uh, these big central systems, you know, there's some, some pretty distinct challenges that we have to look at and we have to be aware of. Uh, reaching code required ventilation rates as we've been talking about, you know, due to things like balancing is obviously one of the biggest challenges that we have to address. Uh, by code, we have to provide a certain amount of airflow and when we have things like stack effect or operable windows and doors, um, you know, you're you're going to have a, a very difficult time getting exactly the code required ventilation rates. You know, sometimes you're going to exceed them, sometimes you won't meet them, uh, depending on what's going on within the system at any given time. And that's one of the reasons that we we tend to have a bigger challenge with indoor air quality uh, when we when we're looking at the larger systems. Uh, air tightness between units is obviously a big challenge when we're looking at multifamily. No matter what, when we're looking at uh, multifamily and central systems, you can't say that we have absolute uh, barriers between the, the units, that you're not going to have cross-contamination, especially due to uh, systems that are, are being impacted by things like stack effect or wind load or things like that on, on a system. Pressurization and, and 
um, dealing with any kind of contaminant movement from the exterior to the interior uh, due to things like parking garages or pools. Uh, so contaminant infiltration is, is certainly something that we have to worry about. Duct leakage, the bigger the system, the, the greater the potential for duct leakage. And of course, dealing with uh, any kind of maintenance and tampering. You know, these systems, especially on the exhaust side, the duct does get dirty. Um, you're going to have some kind of tampering over time. Unfortunately, everyone knows what balancing tampers do. Everyone knows how they work. Uh, and therefore, you're, you're going to have people uh, that are, are going to uh, manipulate them and change them because they think that they, they want less noise or less airflow uh, for any given reason. And so over time, uh, there's no way to guarantee that a building that was once balanced is, is forever balanced. Now, when we look at um, these central systems, um, you know, there are solutions to address the the challenges in central systems. And, and I just want to touch base on this very quickly, even though it's not the intent of the presentation today. But I wanted everyone here to be aware of, uh, of a new product that we launched. Um, a lot of people are familiar with Aldis as a brand due to the constant airflow regulator product. So with the CAR 3, which we just launched, um, this past year, we now have the ability to uh, adjust these in the field, right? Previously with the CAR-2, they were, they were not adjustable, uh, not in a way that was easy to adjust. There was a lot of limitations. Now they also have a dual side adjustability. So I have the option to install it in a supply or an exhaust configuration. And I will always have access to the dial that you use to adjust it, which is the little green knob on the airflow regulator. So as I turn that dial on the airflow regulator, the indicator that's on the side there will move and it'll show you what your CFM is. So that allows me to have the ability to make adjustments or visually confirm uh, what the set point is for the airflow regulator regardless of its position within the system. So that's a, a pretty significant change for us. It's unique to the market. So it's not to say that central systems, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not to say that central systems uh, don't have solutions to help them perform better. Um, but, you know, there, there are definitely uh, better systems, right? So when we're, when we're looking at central systems today, you know, if, if that's the preferred type of system or if it's a retrofit project, uh, we still have options to improve the, the performance of those systems. So what's the alternate to a central system, right? This is where we start to talk about what can we do to get away from the, the old and the more common methods of design in, uh, for ventilation systems in multifamily specifically. So when we're talking about these types of systems, we like to talk about increasing efficiency by decreasing complexity. That's the easiest way to try to explain it. So we'll start with what is it? What is a compartmentalized system or distributed mechanical system? It's one of those things that goes by many names. So what is it? Well, the idea visually representing this um, the easiest way to show this is you have uh, one system, you know, your system on the left-hand side here, which is one structure that has a lot of rooms. On the right, we have, you know, a skeleton that holds a lot of structures, right? You have many spaces stacked on top of each other, but not interconnected, right? And so how do we achieve that, right? Well, we, we shrink the size of the system to the point where now you have one system per suite, not one system handling uh, many suites, right? So by shrinking the size of the system, we can do things like mitigating stack effect, increasing control, increasing balance. Uh, <clears throat> there's, there's a lot of benefits to this. Um, and And one of the methods by which we can look at uh, of controlling stack effect, right? So stack effect is the result of two things, right? When we look at the, the, the formula for what stack effect is, what the impact of stack effect is on a system, 
the variables that we input into that equation are the outside air temperature, my indoor air temperature, and the height of the system. So the colder it is outside, the greater that delta is between indoor air and outdoor air, and then the taller the system, that is going to have a bigger impact on what the stack effect is, right? So that's why stack effect is generally uh, having an, a more significant impact in the winter because the delta is greater, but you still have stack effect in the summer as well. Anytime that you have any kind of difference in outdoor air temperature and indoor air temperature, you're going to have a difference in air density. Then you're going to be multiplying that by the height of the system. So <clears throat> when I look at a distributed mechanical system, I can basically take the height of the system and bring it to zero, right? Because I don't have vertical shafts anymore. Everything is localized. So I'm not going in, in, through multiple levels of the building anymore. I just have the individual unit. So that's in general, how we can eliminate things like stack effect and, and stack effect being taken out of the equation immediately makes systems much easier to control. So what are some of the other positives? You know, of course, we touched base on the fact that we're eliminating the vertical shafts, but what are the other benefits of eliminating vertical shafts besides stack effect? Right, well, one of the things is I can now put a space that would otherwise be dedicated to those vertical shafts back into the apartments. It's now usable space, it's rentable space. So that's going to be a big benefit for the developers or the building owner, whoever's renting that space or, or trying to, uh, to make a profit off of that space. And of course, what are we connecting to those shafts? <clears throat> the roof mounted equipment can be drastically shrunk if not eliminated entirely, right? So when we take these, these vertical shafts, which would, were previously dedicated to uh, handling the exhaust air and the outside air to the individual units, now I only need shafts for common areas, right? So I'm not necessarily saying that we can completely eliminate the uh, equipment that would otherwise be on the roof, uh, but we can often shrink it to the point where we can either take it off the roof, we can hide it more easily, maybe we can put it in the basement, we can put it in a mechanical room. Uh, we have a lot of options now, but by being able to take things off of the roof, now I can utilize the roof more effectively. So one of the options that we were talking about earlier in 780 CMR talked about renewable energy and where are we gonna put solar panels, right? Probably on the roof. So having a roof that's unobstructed and, and easier to work with makes it easier to have solar panels, makes it easier to have a green space on the roof, uh, a way to have some kind of activity center on the roof. Uh, sometimes we see use of rooftop bars, things like that. And, and it makes it difficult to have those types of spaces depending on the size and the footprint of the building. So by being able to eliminate that equipment, you have a lot of benefits. One of the other items that we talked about uh, earlier in terms of code and 780 CMR was air tightness. Well, when we look at compartmentalized systems, we can have better air tightness on the space because <clears throat> now we're, we're removing penetrations into the air, the air barrier of the individual units, right? So I no longer have uh, uh, risers that are passing through the floor, then, you know, penetrating through my air barrier, through my fire rated barrier, um, yeah, so I'm going to have significant improvements in my air tightness within the space. So that's going to be a, a something that we can look at in terms of the items that we want to check off the list for satisfying 780 CMR. Now, of course, compartmentalized systems don't guarantee air tightness, but it certainly makes it easier. Uh, another thing that, that is definitely worth pointing out is the system efficiency, the overall system efficiency, right? When you look at a, a DOAS unit or a rooftop unit, I have to have a fan with sufficient fan power to overcome a great deal of duct loss. Not only that, but I have to create enough pressure in that system so that I can have pressure drop at the end of the system for balancing, right? So it's not exactly the the best way to do it, right? So by comparison, an in-suite fan, you only have to balance the fan. 
I don't have to create any additional pressure over the uh, pressure that I'm, I'm generating to overcome the duct loss. Uh, I also don't have to worry about any additional pressure to deal with stack effect, right? Again, because we're getting rid of stack effect. So the system from just a fan power consumption is more efficient. Demand control also plays into that efficiency, right? If I'm not in that space and I want to shut down the ventilation for that space, because of course ventilation is a huge uh, demand on, on energy. If I can shut down the ventilation for that space because it's empty, or, or unoccupied by having a distributed mechanical system when I shut down one unit it's not going to have any impact on any of the other units whereas if I was in a central system you close off a damper let's say for ventilation to one unit there's going to be a change in pressure that's felt through the entire system so the, <clears throat> the system will have to try to react you know whether that's through VFDs or you know, uh, through something like the constant airflow regulators, which will uh, adjust to try to maintain flow. Um, in a distributed system, you don't have any of that. And by having more control with no impact over what's going on anywhere, uh, I have improved my indoor air quality, right? It's easy to see how when something's easier to control and easier to balance, and I have less contaminant movement, I'm going to have better indoor air quality. And importantly, we need to talk about cost, right? So we can show that we'll have a lower initial cost for this system compared to a central system. Because of course, if we can't do that, then you have to really be able to show a lot of paybacks elsewhere. But if we can show not only that the system is more efficient and it satisfies the energy code and it has a lower cost, it becomes a no brainer. Furthermore, we can show that it has a lower operating cost, right? So the, the operating cost comes from the fact that the ventilation for the individual units is now off of house power. I can very easily do energy metering for the cost of the ventilation, right? So if I have a central system, there's no way to do that. So by putting the uh, ventilation systems in the suites, now the tenants uh, can pay for them themselves, right? So I have the ability to do energy metering and, and lower my operating cost. So lower initial cost, lower operating cost, better efficiency, better indoor air quality, right? These are all big pluses. Of course, one major challenge that we'll have to deal with is envelope penetrations, you know, whether it's aesthetic, or meeting code there, right? Because you have to have a certain amount of separation between uh, your penetrations. So for building cost, we can go over this very quickly, but the smaller systems are easier to design, right? Within a system, you're probably going to have, or within a structure like a multifamily building, you're probably going to have four, five, six, maybe uh, different floor plans that'll have to design to. And these systems are easier to design around because they're less complex. They're smaller. I don't have to worry about penetrating my fire rated barriers. Um, they're easier to install uh, from an equipment standpoint. I don't have to worry about, you know, dealing with my loads or weights or anything like that on a system. I don't have to plan for that anymore, right? It makes it very easy for me to integrate these smaller ventilators into uh, those spaces. And when I do in, integrate something like a small ERV into a space, it's not going to, to create any significant change that would require a, a revision or a change to my in-suite heating or coolant, right? So these are all things that make these products very easy to work with. And we look at a cost standpoint. So I have two scenarios and, and this data was, uh, we were assisted in putting this together with a contractor and we gave them uh, two hypothetical scenarios, right? Basically two identical buildings, one being a central system and one being a unitized system or a distributed mechanical system. When we looked at the central system, we ended up coming up with a average cost per apartment for that building of $5,600 or just over $5,600. Uh, when we looked at scope two, which is a distributed mechanical system, so everything else the same, just the difference in rooftop versus um, the in-suite ventilator and all the things that go with that, right? Like fire-rated barrier penetrations, things like that. 
the savings was about 35%, right? And a lot of that comes down to labor costs, material, um, you know, everything else that we're doing within that system um, as a difference between <clears throat> the central versus the distributed. So 35% savings is huge. Um, now, of course, there's probably some variables that we might be forgetting, but we've gone through this exercise with a lot of contractors on a lot of actual projects, and they've never been able to definitively prove that the system is, is more expensive uh, than a central system. So air quality, right? When we're looking at air quality, a lot of the things that we've talked about already are easy to, to apply to <clears throat> indoor air quality, right? Simplified balancing. When I have the ERVs in the suite with the fans in the ERVs and I'm balancing those fans and I don't have to worry about stack effect, I don't have to worry about a whole lot of duct loss, it makes these systems very easy to balance and very easy to set up. And because they're not impacted by stack effect, they're going to maintain correct airflow all year long, right? You're not going to have to worry about uh, the environmental factors or even the factors due to occupant use, whether it's operable windows and doors or other items within the space, um, you know, whether it's a washer and dryer and things like that, you're only going to see an impact on those individual spaces because they're not directly connected to the other dwelling units within the structure. And then another big thing that we like to talk about is system redundancy. If we have any kind of failure in the equipment, I'm only having uh, to replace or maintain a one piece of equipment. Right, so if I lose a fan on a DOAS unit on a roof, how many units is that going to impact, right? It could be a very large percentage of the building, which can create all kinds of problems, especially depending on what kind of uh, tenants we have within that space. If it's ALF or if we're doing any kind of medical care within that facility, uh, then things start to get very complicated when you have equipment uh, malfunctions. So having redundancy within the system, you know, when we're looking at it holistically, is a is a really big deal. And of course, we already talked about demand control, having the ability to simply uh, change ventilation rates, whether it's increase it or decrease it on demand based on use. Uh, if you have a lot of people there, um, if you have children, pets, etc., we can monitor humidity within that space, and the equipment can can be activated and put into high speed on demand based on those those readings within the space. Um, we can also utilize these uh, for on-demand spot ventilation, like a bath fan. So we have the ability, rather than doing like a low volume continuous, we can do low volume continuous and a boost on demand. So the occupant has full control over the comfort and, and their indoor air quality. And as we know today, indoor air quality is certainly something that's coming to the forefront. Uh, the end users are becoming more and more aware of what indoor air quality is and why it's important, especially in multifamily. So what kind of equipment are we talking about and we're, when, we're, when we're discussing distributed mechanical systems? There's really two options that I'll be touching base on today. Um, not to say that they're the only options, but these are certainly the more cost-effective solution. So one option is having a small uh, heat or energy recovery ventilator, something that's been sized specifically for the application, right? I.e. it's easier to install. Um, so we have two options, or two models that have a lot of options per model uh, that are sized to fit above the ceiling uh, between trusses. And when we're looking at specifically the ERVs, uh, we won't need to do things like condensate drains. HRVs will require piling. ERVs, depending on the manufacturer, uh, don't necessarily require condensate drains. For ours, we don't require condensate drains for any climate in North America. So that definitely would apply to, uh, to the Boston area, but we also um, manufacture this equipment for Canada, which has much worse design conditions. So just looking at one model for a moment, just to give you an idea of what these look like and what kind of features they have. So an E80 HRX is one of the models that is designed for installation in the suite above a ceiling. So it's a horizontal installation. You have on one side of the unit connections that are going to go to the exterior wall and on the other side of the unit connections that are going to go to the interior, um, whether it's plumbed directly into the space 
or it can go to the return on an air handling unit or a fan coil unit or you know what our option whatever uh, heating and cooling system might be in that space. Uh, the leaving air temperature off of the ERV is going to be more than high enough for any of those air handling units or, or heating or cooling devices to handle that load. Uh, these are optional with EC motors, and we even offer things like free cooling economizers. Now, of course, by code, they're not required, but yeah, when you look at the building as a whole, I'm still ventilating at a very high volume, so we like to include the economizer as an option on, on these units as well. But taking it one step further, we can get a little more advanced, right? So the individual ERVs are great. Certainly they can satisfy my code requirements, but now you have to have an access panel, right? And nobody likes access panels. So what can we do to kind of improve on this system? Make maybe it a little easier to work with, a little easier to install. Basically what we've done is we've taken a fan coil unit and built an ERV right into it, right? So we call that the IQ series of vertical fan coil units. So from a fan coil unit standpoint, it's pretty straightforward, right? Three quarter to three ton of cooling capacity. We can do a two pipe or a four pipe, just like any vertical stack fan coil. But uh, as one of the things that we're doing to address the changes in code that require things like, you know, 100% electric, getting away from gas, um, now we should be looking at options like refrigerant coils, right, for the cooling. Uh, we can do hot water off of the local hot water source within the space, um, or we can do a, a heat pump option where we can provide um, a, a heat pump to do the cooling and the heating. Now with our systems, they're all designed for remote mounted condensing unit or remote mounted uh, heat pump. So we do that you know, for a handful of reasons, but one of the most important is uh, acoustic performance, right? Heat pumps uh, tend to be rather noisy. Um, so by being able to take the heat pump and remote mount it, I can take that noise out of the space and end up with a system that is as loud as any normal fan coil unit. Now the ERV within that unit is going to be uh, rated for up to 120 CFM at four tenths of an inch water column, also uses EC motors and is rated for up to 75% recovery efficiency. So it more than satisfies the 50% minimum uh, that's required for code. So uh, the, my last comments here on 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 this unit. Um, basically, you have a fully integrated heating, cooling, and ventilation system as a single device. It's one piece of equipment to install. It's a single point power, right? There's no compressor that's in the unit, so it's all 120 volt. Um, all of these units are the exact same size, right? So depending on if it's a three quarter ton or a three ton unit, they're all exactly the same size. Uh, no additional access panels uh, in terms of the energy recovery unit by itself. So what you see is what you get. Full occupant control over the indoor air quality, right? And that would apply to the standalone ERVs or the ERV built into the fan coil unit. And again, really one of the big emphasis is that we have for this is how can we do more than the minimum without going over budget? which again, that's really the intent of stretch code. So I actually, I copied this from mass.gov. So stretch code emphasizes energy performance as opposed to prescriptive requirements and is designed to result in cost-effective construction that's more energy efficient than the built-to-base energy code, right? So that's really what we're looking at here, right? The ability to um, provide a solution and a system that's going to be cost-effective and do more than the minimum, right? And so we're doing more than the minimum, not just in terms of energy efficiency, we're doing more than the minimum in terms of addressing indoor air quality, in terms of addressing ease of use, ease of installation. Um, so certainly we believe that this is uh, the, the method of kind of the future. Uh, we see uh, distributed mechanical systems as being the best way to address ventilation in larger buildings. Uh, it's certainly easier to control, and any time that you can make something easier to control, it makes it easier to make it cost-effective. And 
easier to make it more energy efficient. So that's really what the focus is for these. So that's the end of my presentation. I do see that there's some questions here, um, but I know that Matt also has a portion on um, fire dampers that he wants to touch base on. Uh, Matt, do you want me to go over the questions first or do you want to do your part of the presentation? Um, let's, I was just wondering that myself. Why don't we, why don't you address those questions? Do you see the questions I just assigned to you? Yep. Why don't you just uh, address those questions quickly if you can, and then I'll get into my stuff. Of course. Uh, so I have a, a few questions from Chris here. Um, so, uh, yeah, definitely, um, you know, the negative considerations to discuss, you know, the, the negatives that I mentioned in, in my pros and cons slide. Uh, the aesthetics of so many more louvers uh, on, on the exterior wall, definitely that is a challenge, right? That's something that we have to address. I do have a lot of good examples, uh, Chris, that if, if you want, we can send over to you um, where projects that have already been done and, you know, just using like Google Street View to try to see the louvers, you can't see the louvers. So there are definitely ways to do it. Now, obviously that can't be applied to every project, uh, but there are options. Um, and another option in terms of uh, partially addressing your other question as far as the separation, because uh, the slides that I show um, don't necessarily look like 10 feet of separation between your outside air and your exhaust air connection. That can absolutely be a challenge, right? That's something that we have to have. Um, so there are ways to get around that. Um, you know, one, one common method that we see uh, being used is to do kind of a hybrid central system. So we have the ventilator still located within the suite. Uh, we have a louver, a louver on the exterior wall for your outside air. But the exhaust air actually goes back to a riser and then a takeaway fan on the roof. So we only have one riser rather than two risers. So I'm still saving floor space compared to a, a central system that has an outside air and exhaust air riser. Uh, and I still have better control over that system because when that system is shut off within the room, it does have dampers to close. Uh, that way I'm not going to have any kind of excess leakage. Um, when I look at things like stack effect, you know, the stack effect, the pressure still has to overcome the pressure drop internally within the ERVs in the suite for the filters, the heat exchanger, the fans, et cetera. So the amount of uh, impact of stack effect on those systems is still going to be reduced compared to a traditional central system. And uh, as far as uh, defrost and the ERV, uh, there are a couple different options for frost control on these units. Uh, we have uh, recirc options, and we also have exhaust options, uh, exhaust only defrost, which is uh, to your point in your comment here, uh, it does mean negatively pressurizing the space. Um, so uh, when you're going to have a negative uh, pressure in that space, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna see something like that acting on a system, but if you compare that to uh, a central system, right, obviously doing exhaust only defrost on a central system, big ERV on the roof, you can't have the entire building going negative all at the same time. Uh, so that's when you have to start integrating other frost control options, whether it's a preheat or uh, maybe like a variable speed or a face and bypass, all of which are, are going to have uh, impacts on the performance of that system. So even doing an exhaust only defrost for an individual unit is still really a good option that, that we can look at um, compared to addressing frost control on a big central system. Um, and then your, your last question here or comment, um, can we tie the IQ for remote heat pump into a VRF? Uh, possible, right? In theory, possible. Uh, and I say in theory because uh, VRF requires um, controls from the VRF manufacturer. So depending on the VRF manufacturer that's selected, um, we would have to, to uh, verify that they have a coil package option that meets the size requirements of the individual fan coil units because not all, uh, not all VRF manufacturers go down to such a small coil a lot of times they have much larger coils that would be installed in something like a third party air handling unit or, or DOAS unit, uh, not necessarily a small ERV. So um, 
certainly it is possible to do a refrigerant coil is a refrigerant coil. It's really just up to the, the control side. Great. Thank you, Scott, for answering those questions. You're very welcome. Yeah, and any other questions you have during design, I'd be happy to um, work through those with you. We've done uh, a few designs, quite a few designs um, since this technology's begun out in Massachusetts. We have some uh, job sites we could even recommend, uh, you know, as examples. Um, so just reach out to me and we'll be able to answer those questions. So Scott, why don't you make me the, actually, I think I can make myself. Okay, there we go. Okay, so, um, in tangent to what we're talking about here, a lot of these projects that we're discussing right now have a lot to do with uh, wood frame construction. In in the Buckley or in the Massachusetts market alone, we see quite a few of these multi-unit family uh, residential systems as uh, wood frame construction. So before we get into this fire rated air distribution conversation, I want to show you a quick video from Greenheck to put you guys all into the right mindset of what we're talking about. So here we go. Greenheck, building value in air. Ceiling radiation dampers or ceiling dampers are used to protect penetrations through the ceiling membrane of fire rated floor ceiling assemblies. The UL fire resistance directory dictates what dampers are required to penetrate the ceiling openings based on the ceiling design number. One category of fire rated floor ceiling designs are those utilizing wood trusses as their structural members. This video discusses the use of ceiling radiation dampers in wood truss floor ceiling assemblies. Greenheck CRD-1WT and CRD-2WT are designed to meet the growing market demand for buildings with these designs. The CRD-1WT is designed with a plenum box for easy side inlet and side outlet duct connections. The CRD-2WT allows the inlet or outlet duct connection to be made on the top of the damper. Greenheck also offers two different mounting options to make installations quick and easy. The first is the hanger method, which allows the damper to be supported from above using steel straps, wires, or ankles. The second mounting option is the base mount method, which utilizes two mounting angles to support the damper at the bottom cord of the truss. The standard closure device on all Greenheck ceiling dampers is a fusible link. The fusible link keeps the damper blades in the full open position to minimize pressure drop. Both the CRD-1WT and CRD-2WT are available with an optional volume controller, which adds the functionality of a balancing damper and allows you to position the blades using the adjustment screw. These features make the CRD-1WT and CRD-2WT the most flexible and widely accepted ceiling dampers for wood truss applications in the industry. Greenheck will continue to lead the industry. Okay. So... Um, one sec, I'm going to pull this up. So as you guys can see, we're talking talking about wood frame construction in multi-unit, multi-family unit construct uh, buildings. So uh, let's talk specifically about fire rated air distribution, because to be honest, this is something that we see an issue with all the time. And I'm not talking about 99% of jobs. I'm talking about 100% of jobs in our market. This is something that our estimating department has, uh, you know, actually really brought to our attention that this is an issue um and i don't want anybody to feel targeted because it seems like mo this is quite an issue for most uh people designing wood frame construction so the uh, the uh, the approach the detail that we typically see in these designs is what we would call the commercial component approach and that would be completely co uh code compliant with the thermal blanket for non-wood frame fire rated floor to floor to ceiling assemblies so these are these are great for non wood frame construction, right? And what's different here, uh, in, as opposed to what you just saw, is the ceiling open ceiling opening versus the next size. So as you can see here, this ceiling open opening is quite a bit larger than the next size, and any heat source that would be be um, exposed that would expose uh, to the to the floor to ceiling assembly is actually protected by that thermal blanket. So a lot of the times we'll see this thermal blanket specified on a commercial diffuser like this. This could be, say, a price SMD or a competitor uh, of equal construction. Um, but what we really need to provide for wood frames uh, construction is a boot similar to this. Now, this is actually a picture from the Greenheck uh, 1WT, actually 2WT. IOM, or actually that's a 1WT, uh, and this is the the point here. This is actually you know a lot of different uh, 
manufacturers have a, a box like this. Uh, the point here is to show you that this is really the only code compliant device that should be used in a construction like this. And this is for wood frame fire rated uh, ceilings. So this next size, as you can see, is the same size as the ceiling open opening. And that's very important because as I discussed, the there's no heat sources being um, exposed to that floor to ceiling assembly. So within that box, that UL rated box, uh, we would put a, a diffuser similar to this. So this is a price light commercial diffuser, LCMD, and actually has an opposed blade damper on the back for volume control. And this, you know, this actually looks much better for applications where um, in, a, in a residential application because it's not a, a big ceiling opening. Um, it's not a, you know, a big diffuser and it looks a, a lot better architecturally, you know, in our opinion. Now, this can actually be mounted inside of then a, uh, a, a ceiling radiation damper boot. And this is actually the only way to ensure compliance with UL in a wood frame construction. So uh, this boot, along with a diffuser like this, could um, be used to uh, in, a, in your detail. And it, it, we could actually provide you a detail like this. So this is the Buckley prefabricated ceiling radiation damper box assembly. So um, everything is called out here. If your price LCMD, the pose blade damper, your ceiling radiation damper in the prefabricated boot, it could be insulated or not insulated. You could insulate it in the field. Um, but this will really keep you out of hot water with any AHJs during inspection. And there's actually been some issues uh, in the past where uh, the, the, the typical component approach um, is, you know, it causes issues. So not only is it not UL rated, it does not provide a UL rating as, uh, assembly that is UL rated, but it's actually more expensive and takes longer to install as well. So uh, to break it all out for you to see it, you know, see the numbers, um, a ceiling, a, a, a price SMD with an OBD uh, could cost about $26. Um, with, add the fire rating blanket, add the ceiling radiation damper, and then add the field fabricated plenum box, and you're up to about $103 with insulation. And all that takes about three hours to install. Now, on the other hand, you could use a prefabricated UL classified boot assembly and spend about half that on the budget price and about half that time as well. So these are very important details to have locked in tight on your drawings. And uh, this is something that I'd also like to send you in the follow-up email. So um, that's that. I just wanted to make sure everybody's familiar with uh, how to specify these fire rated air distribution assemblies. And uh, that's, that's it for my just quick little presentation. Um, we appreciate your time today. If there's any questions, uh, feel free to ask now or also feel free to ask me afterwards in my follow-up email. So with that said, um, I don't see any more questions. So Scott, thank you. Uh, thank you everybody else that uh, put together this uh, presentation today. Um, feel free to reach out to us after this presentation and uh, I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks, Matt, and thank you, everybody. All right.